Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Radio Free Cannabis, coming to you from high in the hills of Oakland, California, translated into 195 different languages. We are the voice of the global cannabis freedom movement, and I am your host, Steve D'Angelo. Thanks so much for sending your questions and comments in. Please keep them coming. Remember to support the companies that support this podcast. Harborside, Homegrown, Liberty Clothing, and I'm going to introduce you to a new company uh, right now, which is Hemp Zoo, which makes these beautiful, beautiful garments, 55% hemp, 45% organic cotton, a uh, lovely, lovely t-shirt. And, uh, and then this mask, which um, I'm not going to put it on right now, but it's got just this lovely clinging kind of line to it. Unlike all the Hemp Zoo stuff, it feels full of life. Um, also, uh, please remember to subscribe to the podcast and let your friends uh, know about the podcast. Ask them to subscribe as well as we build this global community. The legalization of cannabis in Canada and the subsequent opening of its public stock exchanges to cannabis companies has changed the world of cannabis forever. It's brought vast quantities of capital and sophisticated corporations to a landscape that up until then had been largely occupied by small business people, many of whom were graduates of the gray and underground markets. The changes have been sudden. For some people, they've brought success and even wealth. For others, they've brought distress and even displacement. So there's many strongly held opinions within our community about this. Some of us see this new explosion of commerce as the culmination of decades of work by activists, as a new and powerful opportunity to influence policy and advance legalization all around the planet. Others see it as an invasion, a corporate takeover from the people who really love cannabis, the people who have sacrificed the most to carry her through the long, dark years of prohibition. I'm of two minds. There's no doubt that the arrival of investors and corporations has helped make legislators and government officials more open to the idea of cannabis reform. The suits and ties are effective. When government officials hear the truth about cannabis from people who look and talk like them, it's easier for them to accept it than when it comes from people who look and talk differently. So cannabis reform is spreading farther and wider today than ever before, and that's a great thing. On the other hand, many of the new investors and business people live in the same bubble of privilege as the government officials. Their understanding of cannabis can be limited. They're often motivated primarily or exclusively by financial gain. The policies they advocate are usually self-interested, and they are not infrequently dismissive of connecting cannabis to any greater causes of social justice. So the reform they spread is sometimes seriously flawed, and that's a problem. Either way, whether you see the mainstreaming of the cannabis industry as a positive or negative, it seems destined to continue all around the globe. And today, we have a unique opportunity to get an inside view of the whole thing from a man who is both a lover of cannabis and a super successful Canadian investor and entrepreneur. Paul Rosen played a key role at the very beginning of the birth of the Canadian industry. He was a founder of Pharmacan Capital, now known as the Kronos Group, which was one of the earliest huge successes in Canada. Since then, he's been one of the most active investors in global cannabis and a trusted advisor to some of the most powerful companies. Paul's other cannabis inventors include Tidal Royalty, Breakwater Venture Capital, and Global Go. Unlike a lot of the new suits, Paul has a personal relationship with the plant. He's almost always ready to smoke a joint, and I don't think I've ever seen him in a tie. Paul, welcome to Radio Free Cannabis. Oh, it's such a privilege and a pleasure, Steve. It's great to see you, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk with you today. 
great to see you too. Wonderful. Um, Paul, what I'd like to do is, is just roll back to, you know, your earliest engagement with the plant. When did you first encounter it? How old were you? What did that mean to you? Yeah, you know that expression, you never forget your first time. <laughs> I can never forget my first time I actually got high from cannabis. So I'll tell you exactly. It's like sketched on my brain forever. I was um, seven, 16 or 17 years old. I just can't remember. And I was in high school. And uh, quite frankly, the high school I went to, cannabis was and actually quite a few other recreational drugs were really pretty much ubiquitous, but I had sort of avoided it. And of my peer group, I was the holdout, if you will. Um, but I think when I was in, yeah, when I was in grade 12, uh, I smoked for the first time and did not get high. And someone had explained to me that that's not an uncommon phenomenon. You have to kind of break your seal. The second time I smoked, um, and I had no like familiarity with strains and you know what what might do what but the person that kind of lit me up said this is called Maui Wow it's very strong and um, I will never forget it uh, it was unlike any cannabis experience I've had since and God knows I've had like thousands but I got like almost like psychedelically high not almost I got psychedelically high uh, the next three hours I had completely departed from my ordinary state of consciousness and was immersed in this like shiny, bright, fresh, new consciousness. And I, I loved it. I didn't just like it. I absolutely loved it. And everything I had thought about cannabis uh, clearly was erroneous. Um, and I uh, became pretty much uh, in short order after that, uh, a pretty frequent, if not habitual user of the plant. And I, I should say, you know, as a pretty s serious kid, I was, uh, I had serious academic uh, aspirations. I had, you know, even at that young age, sort of like trying to like get serious of my future. And, you know, cannabis was just for me a tool, uh, as I can explain, uh, that helped me in a number of ways, uh, become the person that I am, <laughs> for better or for worse, I suppose. Uh, so that was my first time. And it really is, I don't think I've ever, from uh, imbibing any uh, form factor of cannabis, ever quite had that, you know, shocking effect. Uh, it was incredible, to be honest, Steve. So similar to, to my experience, I was a few years younger uh, than you were when I first ingested cannabis. And it actually did work on the first time <laughs> it took a little while but it did and um, but it was a revelation uh, uh, i you know i knew immediately after i had consumed cannabis for that first time that uh that it was something that was going to be in my life for the rest of my life and it's what set me on my course to to be an activist and you know i think back on those days and the whole milieu of cannabis that i grew up in and 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 the the views of of the greater society at large and how much it, it's really changed. Um, could you draw a picture um, as you were moving from your teen years into being a young adult? What was the general scene with cannabis in Canada? Um, who was smoking it? And how did people who weren't smoking it feel about people who were? It wasn't it wasn't quite that taboo, to be honest. I, I never really thought I was, you know, like some badass outlaw smoking pot. Certainly in my peer group, it was near ubiquitous uh, we, there wasn't much drinking but there was a, a lot of cannabis use and quite frankly there was a lot of other uh drug use but cannabis was pretty accepted at, like at least in the bubble that i lived in and there wasn't like this sense of we got to be super careful or like you know if we got busted we're going to be screwed for the rest of our lives so you know canada first talked about legalizing adult use cannabis in the 1970s and our current prime minister's father, the legendary Pierre Trudeau, struck a like a what we call a royal commission to study. It was called the Ladane Commission, and Ladane became a Supreme Court judge in Canada. So as early in the 1970s, there was some political momentum around legalizing cannabis. Of course, that did not happen for a long time, but it wasn't quite like I never really felt I was doing anything that was way, way outside the mainstream. And I never really felt that I was, um, you know, at risk. Now, I should say, um, as I got older, uh, and, and um, I don't know what it was like for you, you grew up in, in California. Is that is that right, Steve? 
I actually grew up in Washington, D.C. area. What was your, did you, I never really felt that I was way out of bounds and taking a great risk for my future and that I needed at least to keep it a, you know, a, a secret. What was it like for you? So the way it was for me was it, it really changed. When I first became involved with cannabis in the early 1970s, um, I thought that, you know, I, I, I went to the first smoking in Washington, D.C. and became involved with the movement just as it was being born. And in those days, we were convinced that it wasn't going to take us more than four or five years to make cannabis legal um, because society in general was changing and moving in positive directions. But then we uh, saw in, you know, with the election of Ronald Reagan, this vast, vast change. And it was really terrifying. Um, uh, you know, once Reagan got into power and, and, and started this cranked up drug war, um, there were all these commercials on TV all the time, basically demonizing people like me. And uh, it was, it was a, a really, really scary period of time when we very much felt like we were being hunted, basically. So, you know, this is the difference between Canada and, and the U.S. on, on, on cannabis policy that um, I think that Canada has always had a more reasonable and balanced approach, even its prohibition had a significantly lighter touch than the U.S. prohibition did. Yeah, Canada, I mean, is just politically permanently to the left of America. And while it's far from a perfect society, we didn't, you know, we, it was, even if you got arrested for like having a quarter ounce of pot, it's very unlikely you, were gonna, you would ever go to jail for that. Um, we punished other drugs much more severely. So I think there was, it was just, while it was illegal until I think 2017 fully, um, it just didn't, I don't think it was quite as uh, pol politicized and, uh, and policed as it will. And I mean, I came of age around, I'm a little bit younger than you, but yeah, the first time I got high was I think 1980-ish or so at the beginning of the Reagan administration. And I do remember we used to make like what we would call verbal memes on, the, on Nancy Reagan's just say no. We had a joke to say just how much for a quarter or just how high can you get? Um, and so we could afford to be a little bit sort of like, you know, cool about it, I guess. Now, I wanna say that also uh, one of the things that happened to me was I was, I, I think a smart enough kid, but I was really a struggling student until I found cannabis. And um, I just remember this vivid uh, event that happened. Uh, I was like a, literally a pass fail student for about four or five years in a row and my parents, were very academically oriented and they were like so concerned and they had like tutors and academic assessments and it was just just felt like frustrated i think i had uh undiagnosed add i really had trouble focusing and then um but i had i wanted to go to university and i actually wanted to be a lawyer i knew i wanted to be a lawyer from an early stage in my life so when i started um uh, smoking cannabis uh my life changed my academic performance went from borderline to exceptional, like really almost like that. In fact, we in grade 12, our high schools and all high schools uh, uh, went through an anonymous survey about whether you use marijuana or not or cannabis. And I filled it out and, you know, questions like, have you ever tried cannabis? When did you start? And what have you noticed? What impact have you noticed on your studies? And I, I answered the, this survey honestly. And I indicated what I've noticed is that my marks have gone like through the roof. I'm a straight A student now. And then I wrote a note at the end to say, I'm serious. <laughs> I actually wrote this down because I said, I, you don't think you probably think I'm just goofing on you or something. And I, and I said, I'm not drawing a correlation. I'm answering your question, but I want you to know it was important to me. I want you to know that I'm not pulling your, your leg here. Uh, this is really what's happened to me. Um, and so I always felt like we didn't have words like, you know, medical yet. It wasn't a part of the vernacular, but I was, yeah, I, I liked getting high and listening to the who at like decibel 10. Of course, that's a lot of fun, uh, driving around with our friends and being idiots, but I was coming home from those kind of fun nights and then working for three hours, I could focus in a way I could never focus before. And, you know, it really improve my outcomes and that was something that no one would want to talk about and at, later in my career when I became a lawyer I had to keep cannabis as like my dirty little secret and I'll say that our attitudes kind of hardened in Canada we had conservative governments and things started to change a little bit and as a lawyer you know I have a solemn oath to uphold the law that's part of the conditions of my license so uh, even though when I first started using cannabis in high school it was pretty much 
not something that I felt I had to keep under wraps. As I became a young adult, I had to be really, really discreet and cautious. And I just hated that. I hated that people would judge me. And it would kind of make you, you know, if you got high, I would start to get paranoid. Do people know I'm high? Are they going to like judge me? So, you know, it's not that simple here. And uh, my relationship with the plant uh, as I became a young adult was uh, I wish this was normalized because I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I actually think it's a good thing, but in so-called polite society, I'm going to be like outre and people are going to, you know, people that are on their fourth martini are going to judge me about my choices. So, um, you know, it's a complicated issue. Uh, unlike you, you know, I didn't have uh, the courage to become an activist, even though I felt strongly that we needed reform. You know, you're a hero because you, you became, you know, a singular figure in the movement to bring a more um, sensible approach to the plant. And I became a lawyer. <laughs> now, I was a criminal defense lawyer, so I certainly was not a corporate lawyer. And I was a constitutional lawyer. But, you know, I wasn't an activist uh, at all. And I, in fact, the, I was the opposite. I was, became anonymous, uh, which is not serving anything other than my own self-interest at the time. Well, you know, again, I think that, um, that, that there's, you know, a couple interesting things to drill down in there, right? Um, I've heard from so many men, mostly men, who talk about how cannabis really was super effective, maybe the only effective thing in helping them engage with learning and helping them focus. Um, and I've just, I've heard this story over and over again. And it's, it's, it's something that we should keep in mind as we think about legalizing and regulating cannabis and make sure that we do not cut off young men who are below the age of 21 from using cannabis in this very, very therapeutic way. I think I was probably using cannabis therapeutically for that purpose as well, Paul, and I, I think a, a lot of other people are. And, and then the other thing that really strikes me in your, in your, your comment there is just the, the power of stigma. You know, we can change laws. The laws are pretty clear. They're on the books. There's a process to change them. We've been quite successful in doing that. But stigma is this slippery thing. You, it's really hard to, to wrap your hands around it, right? It's like stigma is, is in the phone calls that don't get returned to you or in the deals that don't get done or in the whispers that are whispered behind your back that you never, ever hear about or these long awkward pauses and conversations. Um, so it's, it's, it's a much more difficult thing to, to get rid of. I think we'll be working on it long after legalization. Um, well, Canada was a leader um, in, in legalization. And I'd like to, to know uh, now, starting moving to, into that era, right? What that was like for you, because you were, you were right there at the, at the very birth of the legal Canadian industry. What did, what did that look like? Um, so just to tell you, you know, there's kind of a great story about how, how Canada got to where it is. And it's a uniquely Canadian story. Uh, and I, I brushed against this first in the 1990s, long before we brought in uh, what's called the MMPR, like our commercial licensing program. Canada had a medical cannabis program as a consequence of a series of uh, judicial decisions, appellate courts, uh, found favor with the argument that a class of petitioners brought that Canadians had a constitutional right to access medical cannabis with the support of a licensed physician. And this became the law in Canada in a series of seminal decisions in the 1990s. I was a constitutional lawyer in Canada. In fact, I'm the youngest Canadian ever to take a case to the Supreme Court of Canada. So these cases I understood were a bedrock foundation. And this is really important, Steve, because this was not an act of our legislature. This was the act of our highest court, meaning that it was sacrosanct. And the reasoning was that Canadians have a right under our constitution called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to something called life, liberty, and security of the person. Not unlike the American constitution, which is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Court found that court, several courts found that security of the person surely includes the security of your physical health. And if a doctor says, my patient could benefit from cannabis, court says, we're going to recognize that right. At the time, though, the, it was then a liberal government. They had no interest in starting a new industry. So they responded to the constitutional challenge by granting those patients, of which there were 10, 
a small class of patients, the right to grow their own. Okay, so we actually had, if you got your, you can get a sort of like a medical card, you could grow your own cannabis. Government no, knew very little about the plant. And so what happened was that that program, which started with just about 10 people, grew to like up to close to 40,000 patients in the, in the decades that followed. And there was over 8,000 individual grow licenses granted. And it got to the point where the program was beginning to sort of collapse under its weight in that there was not a great deal of regard for public safety, health. These were essentially grow ups put in residential neighborhoods. I'm not judging it, but law and order did not like it. The fire marshals did not like it because they weren't using the best wiring for these kind of lights. And there was all these rumors that these things were like going up in flames. And it is an absolute fact that there was a lot of overgrowing in that program. I knew individual growers that had a license and they had like 400 plants and for themselves and up to three other people. So a lot of that product was finding its way to you know, people that had not registered. Again, I'm not judging it because where else would I get my cannabis but from these kind of sources, but that's the way it was. And um, in around 2012, now I'm gonna bring you up to uh, Call it the new world order of cannabis. Uh, the then conservative government, which I will tell you was avowedly hostile to cannabis. Like they just fucking hated it straight up. Not any nuance to that. But they understood that the old program was a disaster and they were being lobbied by their bread and butter constituents. We'll call it health safety to if we're gonna to have to have this program, which we have to have it, and you can plug your nose at it, can we at least make it safe for everybody? Because it wasn't a safe program, if you will. Neighbors were complaining, patients uh, you know, weren't necessarily certain what it was they were consuming. I'm not saying there was bad intentions, but it wasn't really providing the highest outcome for all constituencies. So when, the, when I first read in our national newspaper about this new licensing, which would grant commercial cultivation licenses, you know, that perked up my interest. I was no longer a lawyer. I was an entrepreneur working outside of cannabis. And with a few other people, we thought we just all had a, this unerring entrepreneurial sense that this was going to be a, a big, a big deal. And um, we kind of got the jump in that we started a company uh, called Hordican Inc., which became Farmer Can, which then became Kronos. Uh, without really a business plan, Steve, just we knew that this was going to be big. We were entrepreneurs. This was myself, Lauren Gertner, Michael Crestel, Steve Eisenberg. And we didn't really have a plan, but we, we wanted to get involved. And we started that company. And uh, to use a, a famous Dorothy Parker comment about the town you're in, Oakland, there, there was no there there at the time. Um, so that was sort of how Canada got to where it is right now. And, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit. I want to keep droning on. Uh, we can talk about what happened next. But um, I felt comfortable then uh, to attach my name to a cannabis company, even though you were quite right about stigma. I have another business uh, which largely operates in the US that I was very nervous about those businesses, customers finding out about my involvement in the cannabis industry. And I wasn't wrong because when eventually it became widely known, I had some customers say, I'll never buy from you again because of what you're doing. You're a drug dealer and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, at that point I was like, on your way, you know, I'm at a point now where I don't need you. I'm sorry you're leaving, but if that's the choice, goodbye. Yeah, um, I think that's a choice that all of us uh, who love cannabis at one time or another have had to to make in our lives. And sometimes, you know, very, very painfully, uh, there was a period in my life where I did not talk to my father for three years because of our disagreements about about cannabis. Um, the, the very first lie, and really just about the only lie that I ever told my parents was, was lying about cannabis because uh, that stigma uh, was so deep. But yeah, you know, I, I, I'm really interested to hear a little bit more about, the, about the, the growth of the Canadian public markets. And, you know, the, the, there's just been this, you know, a few years ago, you didn't have big, huge billion dollar cannabis corporations, and we do now. So how did all that get built in such a small period of time? Yeah, a lot of it was the bankers. I'll be straight up uh, in that regard. So you had this kind of like collision between uh, a group of like wide-eyed, 
eager entrepreneurs, of which I was certainly right, you know, right up there, front row seat. Um, and then you had the Canadian investment bank community, which uh, for your listeners and for our audience, uh, Canada had a pretty active uh, trade in resource and mining, oil and gas. We have some of the, you know, our exchanges are really had been renowned for resource exploration, oil and gas. And around the time that this new MMPR program came in, which was these first round of commercial licenses, there was a, a you know, a bearish market in um, all of those areas that the Canadian investment banks had made their made their bones on. And uh, when you walk through some of these banks, Canaccord and GMP and some of the other big names, uh, Dundee now known as A Capital, during that era, you know, there was a lot of empty desks. So along comes this new asset class that the bankers could, um, you know, make return to kind of glory on. And I will say that um, the bankers played an outsized role in the development of this multi-billion dollar industry and you know they were the gatekeepers in a way so in some ways i say blame canada or blame the bankers for what's happened since because uh, i'm not casting aspersions on their motivation but you know these were like investment bankers so uh, their motivation was largely return on their own capital and their own enterprise and um, it took quite a while for that thesis to sort of like and like excite the public and become a big thing but it started with a handful of companies Tweed, now known as Canopy Growth Corporation. Pharmacan, now known as the Cronus Group. Aurora Cannabis, Afria, um, Better Can Canada, uh, and, a f and a few others. I'm not naming all the names, but these were sort of your early stage, uh, and the Organogram, these were your early stage companies. And the kind of the deal was with the banks, we'll raise you money if you go public because they need to have liquid assets to raise money. And that became that sort of like partnership uh, or, or deal making is what led to the conditions to, you know, what we have now, which is literally over a thousand public cannabis companies, uh, a handful of which have traded uh, at billion dollar valuations, including all the big US multi-state operators coming to Canada to list their companies here, whether it was Acreage, Cura Leaf, Green Thumb Industries, Ianthist, uh, True Leaf, Harvest, uh, on and on and on. So those early days in Canada, really, this this wasn't a big deal. We only had a medical program, but the banks had an agenda here and a business plan to revive their flagging fortunes in the face of that resource slump. And uh, I don't think anyone imagined it was going to become be what it what it has since become. I, never in my wildest, you know, entrepreneurial dreams like don't dream without a ceiling. Think how big can this be? Uh, I don't think any of us imagined, or at least I didn't, and I don't suffer from a lack of imagination that it was going to become as big as rapidly as it did. So it was, you know, straight up thrilling, terrifying, stressful exciting it was like the full range of entrepreneurial emotions and it really is not much different right now it's still all those things um yeah so it's this is really interesting right because in canada there's there's this excitement there's wealth being generated there's these new companies that are growing up they've got vast amounts of money i mean vastly more money than anybody has ever had in the world of cannabis before and so the way this plays out in california is that this is all happening as California is moving from a very large and robust semi-regulated medical market to a very, very strictly regulated adult use market. And, and so there was another collision between California cannabis companies and the uh, Canadian uh, public markets. And what, what I saw happening was, was just a uh, a bunch of money coming into the state and you know people who i had honestly regarded as not terribly competent operators uh who um who had questionable ethics started showing up with tons and tons of money and you know putting up all these billboard campaigns and buying shops and spending a million dollars to build the shops out and 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 sending you know promotional trucks around to all of the locations of their competitors and 
it was it was really overwhelming. Um, and so, you know, what happened in many cases is that the funded companies in California were far more capable of getting licenses, of uh, securing properties, of raising the funds that it, they needed to build those properties out and buy the equipment that they needed. And, and today, um, many, many, many of the people, uh, certainly a majority of the growers that used to supply the legal medical cannabis market have now been driven back to the underground market. And um, uh, we're beginning to turn it around a little bit, but there was actually a significant drop in legal cannabis sales in, in California uh, following legalization. Um, the number of, uh, of growers dropped from something like 10,000 to five or 600. And the way this manifested in the Emerald Triangle was, you know, schools are closing. Um, kids are being called home from college because their parents can't afford the tuition anymore. In some cases, people are selling farms um, that have been in their families for two or three years. You go through once really prosperous towns that were full of yoga studios and health food stores, and um, and, and there's a bunch of, of boarded up put it up storefront. So it's, it's been um, a, real, a real mixed blessing. Like I said in the introduction, I've really been of, of two minds uh, around it. So um, what do you think is going to happen going forward as other countries legalize and open their public exchanges? We're already seeing that begin to happen in Israel. Is, is the role of the Canadian corporations going to continue to be so important on, a, on an international scale, or is that going to change? Yeah, there's so much there. That's um, fascinating kind of stuff we're going through here right now. Um, let me start by saying that there was, you know, allocation of capital did not go after a rigorous evaluation about who is the most deserving or the most qualified. Uh, we may have raised billions of dollars. We also, as a Canadian industry, we also lost billions of dollars. We, you know, we were a, a you give an entrepreneur a, a whack of money, they're, they're going to go spend it. Whether they're going to spend it wise or not is <laughs> subject to interpretation. But we can see that in Canada, you know, pretty much every founding CEO is no longer the CEO of these companies. And a lot of these are good people, but there is maybe, you know, one type of personality to take to take a company from an idea to a certain level, maybe a different type of executive, but there was, there was no fairness. You know, it was almost like a first in first out kind of mentality. And there was a, a, a long period of time there where anyone that came to Canada with the word cannabis on their business plan could raise capital. And the only condition was you have to go public. And so there was a time where all the money was in Canada uh, and that money was now being deployed globally to try to create like these global assets. And I will say to answer your question that a lot of those sort of like world domination aspirations have been, you know, curtailed quite substantially. And we've seen actually the opposite of a lot of the larger Canadian companies unwind a lot of their investment capital in foreign jurisdictions. Uh, they've seen Aurora, Canopy, uh, CanTrust um, and various other companies unwind expensive and non-accretive acquisitions or joint ventures in all sorts of countries like Colombia, like uh, Lesotho. And so they kind of came in, you know, promising the moon and then they left uh, a little bit of carnage behind. So to your question, what's going to happen in these other countries? You know, this is a really important uh, outcome right now because you know we can learn a lot from Canada a lot of what went right but also a lot about what has not necessarily gone right and I feel that um, the problem or the challenge with cannabis is you know it's an, we've created it such that it's an expensive industry with barriers to entry and that perpetuates a certain mentality and a certain type of outcome. So I wish I could say I'm brimming with optimism that we're going to see other countries do it in a way that is more inclusive, but I'm not because I do think at the end of the day, um, money talks in this industry and the, the people that are placing them money, they have one agenda and one, mostly one agenda and one agenda only, which is to earn a return on that capital and to have a liquid investment. 
So um, I feel that there's, we're at almost a crossroads in this industry. What do we want to become? What are our values? What is our soul? What's our mission? Is our mission just to make as much money for a few people as possible? I hope not. And people could say, you know, Paul, you're a rampant hypocrite because you've apparently made a lot of money in cannabis. And I suppose that's true, but, um, but that's, that's, you know, I took a big risk when I could have got annihilated for it and I got, and I got paid out. Okay. But that doesn't mean that I think necessarily everything that happened was in the best interest of building the industry that I want to participate in. So I'd love to get your point of view on this. I feel that, um, you know, that expression by that, uh, journalist, I think Matt Talib's his name about Goldman Sachs. He said they're a giant vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity with their blood funnel stuck into anything that smells like money. It's a famous quip that started a legendary article in um, Rolling Stone. And I think that is the, you know, that is the nature of, of investment banking. Uh, and I'm not making a moral judgment I, what I do a lot of now, I do a lot of mentoring for young companies, and I just want them to go in eyes wide open. I was a naive myself. I did not come. I was a, I ran like a small private business as self-funded. I didn't know nothing from public markets and raising money. I never raised a dollar of capital. And so, you know, a lot of the outcomes for me were really not like we're, I didn't exactly realize how naive I was and that the bankers whispering sweet, nothing is in my ear, weren't necessarily my best friends and that they had a, their own agenda and that there's, you know, I, I've definitely got burned a little bit, I guess. I feel like some of the outcomes weren't what I thought was going to happen. I, I take, I'm cool with it. It's all part of life's great lesson. But, um, you know, I often try to help young entrepreneurs make effective decisions if they do need to raise capital to make sure that they don't enter into term sheets or agreements that they're going to regret at a later date. Uh, and I feel that I'm becoming like a bit of a, a you know, a safekeeper because I love entrepreneurs. Like I, I believe entrepreneurs are amazing and I never want to see them demonized for success. That's not good for anybody. We create, you know, I say about entrepreneurs, we privatize risk and we socialize positive outcomes. That means that when we fail, we fail all by ourselves. We crawl up in the fetal position and, and you know, say, why did I do that? I'm so stupid. Why did I do that? And then when we succeed, we succeed for the benefit of so many communities and constituencies. We create, hopefully, good products or services. We employ people in good, well-paying jobs with integrity. And in the case of cannabis, we help patients in need uh, ameliorate their suffering. So I'm here, you know, uh, as a guy that's been on both sides of this now, an entrepreneur that's been through the, the whole grinder of public companies and is still understands the role of capital and doesn't want to demonize capital, but wants to protect earnest people that are smart and that have, you know, great businesses uh, from negative outcomes, from not knowing that their investors have a plan that may not be their plan. I feel that we should have an industry that is way more inclusive, much more broad-based and less concentrated than, than what has happened for a few reasons. Um, you know, one, because that's just the way I think the world in general should work. I'm, I, I think we should be working on reducing concentrations of power and capital rather than increasing concentrations of power and capital. I've also been stunned by the incompetence of many of the investment banks um, and the people that they've chosen to empower. And it's just been remarkable to me to see people who essentially know nothing about cannabis, do not consume cannabis themselves, and have not really consulted with any subject matter experts getting funded with tens of millions of dollars. And I haven't been surprised at all when we've seen a lot of them go belly up. What encourages me is the thing that just happened in British Columbia, where a regulation has now been passed that will allow small craft farmers to take their product directly to retailers. This is the system that we had in California before uh, 2018. It worked very, very well. It produced great quality products at low prices, they were affordable for consumers. Uh, it was a great system. And so I hope that we can see 
more decentralizing of the of the industry and and deconcentrating rather than um, these aggregations of of capital and power. I'm into that. We need to let more people into the industry and we need to create a unified market. Enough of this like black market, white market, gray market, one market where everybody should be able to participate. And, you know, the thing that I don't like and that I don't think is serving the long-term interests of the people whose shoulders we stand upon uh, is limited licensing. I think it's a mistake. We had it in Canada. I get a regulator is a little bit uncertain and they want to get their sea legs before they let too many licenses you know, enter the program. In Canada, we were very limited licensing for the first two or three years. There was less than 20 licenses for the whole country of 35 million people for like almost three years. Now we have had a acceleration of our licensing. I like the Colorado model or the Oregon model where it's not discretionary, it's administrative. If you qualify, you get a license. If you don't qualify, you don't. And that it doesn't have to be big and you don't need $10 million to, to get your foot in the door. And so I think that um, my wish is that I do believe that we, we should, you know, I do think having a regulated program is actually a good thing. I think as a user myself, as a consumer, you know, I, I didn't like the uncertain outcomes when I would go to my, you know, basement dealer, listen to his shitty guitar for half hour before I could get to the point of why I was there. What I didn't like was it was literally buyer beware. I had no idea. Never mind, like, is the stuff clean? Has it been like, you know, uh, does it have like any microbial content that might give me an upset stomach or distress my lungs? It was like, what's going to be the effect? And we didn't have like Indica or Sativa or Leafly or other strain reviews. So it was just, you know, buyer beware. So I think the idea of having more of a treating it like any other product that where that has some oversight is a good thing. But we've created the conditions where without a lot of money, you, know, you, can't, you can't get in the game. And that means that that becomes crony capitalism, if you will. Uh, and that's why, just to your point, Steve, you've seen uh, companies that really ought not to have been given this um, huge wallet to spend. Uh, they were given it because the providers of that capital weren't really concerned about anything other than their quick return on their own capital. And they had a plan. You know, by the time those companies went belly up, I can assure you, at least the bankers were in and out almost ex entirely. So they had, you know, their compensation often coming in the form of stock. They maybe didn't, they maybe understood some of these operators are not best in class. This is not the best and the brightest, but this is what we got. So we're going to bank it and then we're going to break out of it before it kind of goes to shit. And I think that is something that the rest of the world can learn from. But I have touch points in many of these countries and it, you know, it's very hard to, um, to break out of that, that mentality. And so I, I'm concerned, as I'm sure you are, that, you know, the capital is not going to flow to necessarily the most uh, qualified or entitled organizations. I'm deeply concerned when I see what's happening with regulation in most places. It's it's going towards this model of creating these very formidable barriers to entry that prevent most people from participating and basically sets up a situation, again, with this industry, like with most industries, where unless you're already a wealthy person, you're not allowed in to play. And that's just completely contrary to everything that this plant teaches us. It's completely contrary to the ethic of the cannabis community, which is to spread opportunity uh, widely, to spread resources widely, to build a sharing economy, um, to um, make sure that there's enough food on the table for everybody instead of trying to grab the very last crumb for yourself. And there's just been an, an awful lot of that. And I think that you're right. I think that the answer is administrative licensing. Uh, if you meet certain basic, and I mean really basic requirements, you should be given a cannabis license. Um, let's look at it from a matter of social policy. You know, the cost for a cannabis license, even in some place like Oregon, is magnitudes greater than the cost for a store that's selling tobacco or a store that's selling alcohol or even a pharmacy that's selling opiates that people overdose and die on. 
from a social policy point of view, what we should be doing is making the taxes lower and the licensing less demanding for the substances which are safest for society, which means, man, just about everybody should be allowed to pay to sell cannabis and it should be taxed, if at all, at a very minimal rate. And then these other substances that really do kill people like alcohol and tobacco and opiates, um, they are the ones that should be more appropriately, strictly regulated. I still don't believe in prohibition of, of any kind, but it's just completely contrary to any kind of sensible public policy. And I think it's, it's you know, part of it is because there's a lot of interested people uh, who are benefiting from that system. And part of it is that, that the stigma is just continues to be so deep. I so agree with all of that here, here to that. And, you know, there's essentially been a corporate takeover of government, as far as I could tell. Corporations run our countries now, and they're lobbying dollars to make sure that they get the outcome more or less that they want at a national or at a state or provincial level. Um, and I don't think that we're going to be able to, I think we have to figure out how to work around that uh, you know, absent a full-blown revolution, um, it's it's going to present challenging. On the other hand, I'm you know I'm concerned, but I'm also optimistic, Steve, because um, I feel that um, the sort of overall zeitgeist of the culture is beginning to re-examine our value set, and and uh, cannabis could be that sort of battering ram that helps um, reform uh, opportunities and access to broader communities that don't have the same conventional access to capital that a uh, limited few do. Well, uh, that's a great segue to a question that I wasn't sure I was going to answer, ask you, um, but I'm going to. Um, and uh, that's the one tribe question. You know, on this show, we have a concept that we talk about, the one tribe concept. It came out of my travels all around the world and meeting cannabis people from every walk of life that you could possibly imagine. And, and, and the idea is that now there's hundreds of millions of us all around the world who have had the same experiences with cannabis. And out of those experiences, we've learned common lessons. And out of those common lessons, we've developed a shared value system. And of course, the basis for any tribe, for any group of people that's really going to sustain itself as a group is having a shared value system. Now, some people have pushed back on, on that idea. Uh, some people have really embraced it. I like to think of it as, as the way that we are going to deal with economic inequity of the way that we are dealing with political authoritarianism. My belief is that if enough people around the world are exposed to cannabis, experience cannabis, um, and learn the same lessons that we've learned from it, that will be a lot closer to a planet that is in balance and, uh, and is free and is healthy. So, but sometimes I think I'm, maybe I'm just tripping, right? That, that you know, could it could this really be possible? So I like to check in with some of my more sober-minded uh, friends on this on this whole concept. What do you think about it? I mean, I think it's the most like sort of visionary approach uh, anyone has ever articulated about uh, what we aspire uh, for this plant to help the world. And I think that is such a holy mission, Steve. Um, so what are those? You know, I, let me ask you. Like, I'll say that the value set. Uh, that largely has informed cannabis, legal cannabis, uh, legal medical or legal recreational cannabis, has largely been, um, it's, it's not been one only one simple thing, but a lot of it has been around the money to be made. Uh, there's no doubt. And I will fully cop to the fact that when I uh, was a co-founder and president and CEO of uh, my first public cannabis company, you know, it would be disingenuous to say that um, money wasn't on my mind. It, it, it was, it was. Uh, but as I got more into the industry, I started to broaden my own goals as to what I want to see this industry achieve. So there's so many things that we ought to be doing better. In fact, that we need to do better. So many things. Um, you know, one of the things that I am concerned about is sort of the carbon footprint of our industry, which is massive, which is partly uh, a regulator issue because, you know, if you don't allow outdoor growing as some countries don't allow, 
Um, and then you create a packaging format where you got to like triple over package everything. It's, you know, have you ever seen those YouTube videos about people trying to open their cannabis package? They're hilarious. It's like they just give up. So I feel that um, where we need to do better is we need to be more environmentally sensitive as an industry. And we certainly need to be, and I'm not leading with that. That's just one example riffing up what I'm saying. We need to be way more inclusive as an industry and we need to get regulators across the globe into a more evolved set of thinking. So when I've been fortunate to be able to actually offer advice to other sovereign nations about what should they do, uh, whether it was Greece or Jamaica or other countries I've had the benefit of doing some advisory on, I tried to get them over their cautious, paranoid approach that, you know, that you're dealing with some radioactive substance that you got to handle with caution and assure them that they can just get over that, that we can now prove empirically that all the doom and gloom scenarios about what's going to happen to civil society are just total bullshit. We can look at mature jurisdictions like Colorado and say, so years later, what is the impact on Colorado? Uh, you know, have cats and dogs fallen from the sky? Is, is it a, a gateway drug to more serious drugs? No. Has teenage use gone up? No. Has alcohol use gone down? Yes. Has opiate use gone down? Yes. Are there good new paying jobs? Yes. Is there taxes? Yes. So it's just like, you can actually do this. I've got all these articles because we were all around back then. I think it was in Denver in 2012 when this first happened. And you can just go back and read all of the strong editorials saying, you know, we are at the end. This is the end of our civil society. And like, you know, get ready for everything that you believe uh, to be blown to smithereens. And we can see total propaganda bullshit. So let's go back to what you just chimed on is that we need to turn licensing into an administrative, not a discretionary regime. We need to reduce the cost of entering the industry for everybody. And we need to, as those of us that have had some success, we need to do what we can to lift up other, we'll call them disadvantaged communities that haven't had access to the same success. And there's so many ways we can do this. There's so many ways we can do it. The way I do it is I make myself available for free, not that I'm worth much more than that, but to the degree that I have value, people sometimes will offer to pay me for advice, consultation, and I've made it, you know, one of my give backs to offer uh, free pro bono mentoring to all sorts of companies. I've been doing it for years. I love it. And I'm there to try to help. I'm there to give, but not to take something out. So if we all just tried to bring more of a give, less of a take mentality, we could start to create the conditions for something that is closer than what we want. I, I'm, I wish I could be an idealist. I feel that the world right now, you know, the disparity between rich and poor and the way that the rich disproportionately are able to influence policy does not give me a great hope that we're going to have reform at a government level. So it has to happen at a grassroots level. And it, and it is happening. It is happening. I think it's just happening too slowly. So, you know, what you do moves the needle and what I do maybe can also move the needle incrementally. This is going to happen you know, one brick at a time, but we all, all of us, I think that are like-minded that have that one tribe approach need to really not just talk about it. We need to put our talk into action. And even if that action is as incremental as just trying to help other disadvantaged people that want in or that are in but are having challenges, help them with their challenges by offering your time and taking nothing back, that helps. That really, really helped. Someone wrote me yesterday, a year ago, I gave them some advice. I didn't hear back from them. They wrote me yesterday to say, your advice has set me on the most amazing path. And I just want to tell you, thank you. I was like, that's incredible. What are you talking about? We had like a two hour phone conversation, but they, they say that that was a fundamental moment for them and that only really good things have happened because of their own hard work. So we got to all find where is our most valued use to give back. And then we've got to actually give back. And how does it feel when you do those give backs for you? It feels way better than anything you do in the private sector. <laughs> like straight up, it just does. You know, um, business, it's like an operatic cycle. It's up, it's down, it's just, well, but when you just give and you, you, have, you take your own outcome out of the equation and it's just pure give, 
it's joyous in a way that, you know, even some of the companies I've started that I'm proud of, th those may have been exciting, but they weren't necessarily joyous. And when they were joyous, they were joyous because it was, you know, it wasn't always for the most pure reasons. There was, you know, it was hard not to get a little bit drunk on your own mythology there for a while. Like, oh, look how fucking great I am. You're not that great. None of us are that great. Uh, but when you give something to somebody and you don't, it's not about what did I get out of it? It's just, I'm just doing it for a pure reason. There's a level of joy that is so qualitatively superior to when you're when you're just making money that you know you want to you want to do it again and again. On the other hand, I developed those skills by being you know an entrepreneur and by doing some of the you know taking companies public uh, and and sometimes not being thrilled with the outcome going public, not quite what I had imagined when I started the company. And that, that informs my ability to actually help at an actual level. So I'm not by any means the smartest person. I have, I think, a lot of integrity. I go into these with only pure beliefs. But what I do have is an insane amount of experience running now, I think, 13 companies in multiple industries, um, some of which, three of which have gone public. And just that collective experience makes me valuable to smarter but less experienced people or organizations. So uh, that reads like an invitation to our audience. Uh, so don't be surprised if you, yes. if, you, if you hear from a few of them. Seriously, I've, I'm the guy that has given out my cell phone on stages and given out my email address, paulrosen44 at gmail.com. You know, you write, I will respond. I, I can't be, you know, I have a multiple full fullish time job is in cannabis. So, you know, one of the great things about doing it for free is I can say, I can't help you today. I'm really busy. <laughs> Got to look after my own farm and cow today. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'm there for you. Just give me a couple of days. I need to get, I need to get there. But it's been, um, like I said, joyous, and I'm happy to continue to do that. And let me be clear, Steve, that you always get something anyways. It's like, you just can, like I, when I get to work closely with I think brilliant, energized, you know, people younger than myself, they have a whole box of tricks that I don't have in my mid fifties. And while I may not take anything specific like cash or stock, what I take back is an exchange of ideas. And it, it, I always go back to my own companies a little, just a little bit better because what I've learned from these companies. So it's a very reciprocal thing. I don't sit there and like lecture and drone on and on and on, but I'm able to like, I joined that ARCV mentoring program and that's an, another great outcome. And I've been uh, fortunate to work with a couple of great young entrepreneurs, um, um, both from communities that haven't typically had mentorship. And uh, they're so wonderful. And it's so wonderful for me to be able to add value because I'm not doing much other than just giving my point of view, which, but for them, it's useful. And I got to tell you, so many times in my career, I, was pre-cannabis, I was in really tough situations, like really objectively tough situations. And I bemoaned at that time, you know, when I was up late and I couldn't sleep and I was scared shitless as I often was, there was no one there to tell me, to help me with my decision-making, my critical decisioning. I had no mentorship, none. And, um, you know, I, I live to tell, but it would have been so great just to have someone with more experience than me to say, you don't want to do this you probably, you probably want to do that or what you're doing is exactly what you want to do. Yes, it's painful, but you're making the right decision. So um, like I said, we all have to find how we can give back most effectively. And um, that's for me being my most effective give back. And I've been now doing it, you know, through Global Go globally. I'm helping entrepreneurs in South Africa. I'm helping entrepreneurs in other, in South America. And I'm it's just wonderful because uh, they're so idealistic. They're so motivated to do well for their communities that it really reignites my passion. You know, I kind of had gone through these cycles where I was like, oh, you know, this industry's lost its soul. The only thing left is money. Uh, money's okay. But, you know, when I engage, what, what reignites my almost inexhaustible enthusiasm for this industry is the ideals of the young, the next generation coming up that want to do it the right way. And that, that really excites me. And it keeps me sort of, you know, if you will, forever young and then forever enthusiastic. And this would be an inspirational spot. 
to end the show on, but there's one more question I really want to ask you, which is, what do you think about the pace of change globally? What do you think that, that our listeners in countries all around the world where prohibition is still very much in place can expect? How long will they need to wait? And what role, tell us also a little bit more about Global Go, what role you hope it plays in that process? Uh, I'm actually really uh, excited about the uh, accelerated pace of um, sensible cannabis reform across the world right now. And, you know, just in the last couple of months, we've seen, you know, countries that we wouldn't necessarily have thought were ready for this, like Pakistan would be a great example. Uh, Pakistan is now bringing in a medical cannabis program and a hemp program. It's more than appropriate. Uh, the Kush region is where the original cannabis cultivars come from. And there's a, you know, a cultural association with the plant in, in those societies, but it's encouraging to see more and more countries. So I actually believe that within the next five years, Steve, um, five to seven years, I'll say, uh, the only countries that won't at least have a medical cannabis program will be the most autocratic, uh, le per, most poorly governed countries. And there's only a handful. And I'm not even going to name them because I wouldn't be shocked if even those countries, we'll call them like the North Korea pariah states, I wouldn't be shocked if even those companies, countries saw that only good outcomes could come from bringing in at the very least a medical, but ultimately they should bring in a recreational cannabis program and they're gonna lift up their communities. Let's stop prosecuting people for a victimless crime. Instead, let's bring a transformative medicine to communities all around the world, as well as an economic boom to those same economies that probably need a lift. So COVID, as terrible as it is, is I think a bit of a force multiplier for the development of more and more new markets coming in. So it, it's moving very quickly, uh, more quickly than I had, might have even imagined a few years ago. And I feel like this is now uh, a tsunami and there's no way to put the, you know, the cat back in the bag and that each time another country turns over, it just creates the conditions for the next one to show leadership. So bravo Lebanon, Bravo Israel, bravo Pakistan, you're going to create conditions where the other countries in your region are going to, to get more socialized and more comfortable with bringing in sensible cannabis reform. As to Global Go, uh, a company that you're involved in and that I am the executive chairman in, you know, we're here to help migrate best practices and avoid worst practices that we've learned in the development of the North American industries to all of these nascent emerging jurisdictions. And so I'm there to really, as the chairman of the company, along with this amazing team with regional offices in South Africa, Colombia, Mexico, Cyprus, Switzerland, uh, I probably left off a few. So uh, uh, if I've left off any of my apologies, but we're getting rolling up our sleeves and helping our those jurisdictions through our own advisory located in those countries follow a best practice and where permitted we're lobbying local government to bring a big tent approach and to make sure that they don't just create another asset class for only the very wealthy and very uh, high access organizations to participate in to let full communities and a lot of these communities that have strong agricultural traditions like we'll use jamaica as an example um you know the point is to make sure that all the ganja growers are able to participate in a regulated industry and have an equal opportunity to bring their products to market and not just let a handful of richer organizations dominate the local market so that is our mission at global go uh, i'm confident that we're playing a role at the marginal level. And I'm very excited about the global development, not just of cannabis, but about psychedelics as well. Another plant-based medicine that has great therapeutic benefits. Um, and one that I've also benefited from uh, over the course of my own development. So, you know, Steve, we kind of stand on shoulders of people such as yourself. Um, you're one of the, if there's a Mount Rushmore of cannabis, which there should be a Mount Rushmore of cannabis, 
Hempcrete. You're going on, you're going on. Yeah, hempcrete, exactly. You know, your, your visage is going to be on that. I've said it before to you on stages, and, uh, and I say it again now, that we all owe you and people uh, of like mind uh, that we're doing this before it was vogue, popular, or profitable, and doing it for passion and for ideology. You know, that it, we can't, I can't even calculate the debt of gratitude we owe to people like yourself. Uh, without people like you, we would not be uh, where we are right now as an industry. So it's, you know, these revolutions start at a very low level and then eventually they sort of reach exponential breakout. But you and people like yourself have played a foundational role well above what I've ever done to create the conditions where we could have this kind of dialogue today. So, you know, on behalf of all of us stakeholders, we need you to keep being your best self. We need you to stay on message. We need you to stay on your mission. Uh, and we need you uh, to help move the needle to make sure that we create that one tribe vision that in, you know, is so inspiring and will improve outcomes for more than just a handful of individuals. Yeah, man, right on. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you for that kind appreciation, Paul. Uh, I support it and, you know, look forward to, um, to building this new world uh, that we're talking about with you. Thanks so much for being on the show today. It's been my sincere pleasure. Thank you, Steve. You know, one of the reasons that I wanted Paul to come on the show today is it comes out of how large our community is, how vast we are how many different countries we are in, how many different religions, races, economic levels, educations, religions, anything that you can imagine. We are so different and there are so many of us. And we've been separated by laws and by fear and by stigma. And so sometimes it becomes easy, it becomes easy not to recognize each other. It becomes easy to think about, oh, those big Canadian companies or, oh, those people who are just trying to skirt on the margins. Or, It's really important that we dialogue with each other. And, you know, what comes through for me in this conversation with Paul is the complexity of, of who he is and the role that he's played. Um, his ability to look into some of the things that he's been a part of with a critical eye and to think about what we can do moving into the future. And, you know, one of the reasons that, that I've been so passionate about creating a new cannabis industry, a legal industry, is the idea that we would create not just a new industry, but a new kind of industry that would embody the lessons that cannabis teaches us about nature, about being compassionate, about sharing with each other, about being gentle. And sometimes that's happened. I see some amazing companies doing some amazing work. Uh, very frequently, it hasn't happened. Um, and I think that even people who have been involved in this process of concentration of power and capital in the cannabis industry are coming to see that we will be healthier if we build the kind of system that Paul and I have been discussing, a system that's open to everybody, a system that doesn't require millions and millions of dollars to get into, a system that offers a possibility for people who love cannabis to spend their life working with it, spend their life teaching other people about it, and not having to live in fear anymore. That's the goal that we're all moving towards. And I know that some of you who are listening to this episode are in places where that goal seems very, very far away. Well, it seemed very, very far away for me for most of my life too. But things have changed. They will continue to change. I agree with Paul. This wave, this spark that we started here in California and in Canada is going to keep on going all around the world. And we will not stop and we will not rest until everybody who needs this plant has safe, affordable, and legal access to it, and our last prisoner comes home to their families and is given the resources they need to rebuild the lives that were stolen from them. So wherever you are, stay strong. Know that we are many and we are kind.